a client um, not too many years ago who was concerned about the market. We'd seen some volatility in 2018. He was 90 years old when we had this conversation, sharp as a tack, he used to run a company, really great, really great man. And he said, it's, well, you know, what if the market's volatile and I don't have time to make it up? And I said, uh, well, what do you, what do you mean exactly? And he said, well, you know, maybe the portfolio goes down and, and you know, I'm 90 years old. I don't, I may not have time to watch it come back. And I said, are you talking about being dead? And he said, well, yeah, I'm 90 years old. I could die at any time. He was in great health. He, you know, there's nothing pending. But he said, I could die at any time. I could go at any time. And I might not be able to, to, to have time to see it come back. And I said, if you're dead, what do you care if it comes back? folks, I'm Dennis Allen and welcome to The Disciple Dilemma. Today, we want to talk about the question about recession, inflation, wars, in times like these, how, how should disciples think and how should leaders shape the disciples that are around them? I'm joined today by our guest, Scott McLeod. Scott's the president of Brown Financial Advisory located in Fairhope, Alabama. Scott's got significant experience in the financial sector, so we're going to have a lot of fun today talking about the markets, the dynamics that hit us on the headlines every day. He's got a lot of experience both in the banking side as well as in the investment sectors. He understands the markets really well. Uh, I think we'll really get some wisdom here scrimmaging this whole thing. Um, he's got a terrific resume. If you look at Scott's background, you see that he's got a lot of the tickets punched. He is a CFP, a certified financial planner. He's a CHFC, which means that he's a chartered financial consultant. So this guy not only can look around the corners, he can think ahead. And that's a really important factor when we're going with this. And he's a registered life planner. So his world is helping people think forward, which will be important in our conversation. Um, he's got a terrific uh, career coaching people and helping them navigate in markets. He's worked with families, with CEOs and celebrities. He's a, he's a fast rising star in the, in the Southern financial markets. And um, the most important thing for us today is not only does he carry this expertise, this vocational call in Christ, but he's a believer. And uh, this believer is serving Christ as not only a financial advisor and a financial expert, but he's a part-time missionary. You find him in international venues. His kids are even out on the mission field right now. Um, he has been a philanthropist and has established something called the Three Seed Foundation, which we can talk about in a few minutes. And um, He's also uh, a leader in his local church arena. Now, if we're going to get the rap sheet completely out on the table, he's also a professional musician. He's a runner. He's a triathlete. Uh, I think, Scott, am I right in saying that you actually dabbled in computer science before you finally decided to home in on your, on your final undergraduate work? I did, yes, and thank you for inviting me. I uh, started in the, into computer science before everyone had a computer and uh, studied that for a few years. But I, I took one computer uh, science course and thought, you know, this may not be exactly right. I took a finance elective and that was it. I was hooked and uh, stayed in the finance field from that point forward and have loved it ever since. And I think the other thing we ought to put on the table about Scott is he gets you where you are. This guy, before, grad, before graduating from high school had 26 relocations with his military family. Is that right, Scott? That's right. My father was a career Marine and uh, he, he didn't mind taking a new post. So we moved around. Uh, oftentimes before we could get the boxes unpacked, we were moving them onto the, the uh, shipping container again. So uh, we moved around quite a bit. Well, we're really delighted to have you with us. And, and I know I've already pulled you into the conversation, but thanks for being with us today. Of course. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad to have the opportunity to do it. Well, so... Let's let's take professional Scott for just a minute. Let's do a little CNBC play here with, with folks as they're watching this. Today, you can see the Dow, the NASDAQ, uh, S&P. You know, it's kind of trickling upward a little bit. Volume's okay. But it's been kind of a rocky ride, right? I mean, how, how are the phone calls going for you, Scott, these days? What are you hearing from people? 
Right. Well, um, thankfully, we try to prepare our clients a little bit in advance of volatility like this. So we don't get the phone calls that maybe some of the other advisors get. But but the, the ones we're fielding, of course, are full of fear, uh, uncertainty. In fact, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal um, just within the week that talked about how um, this is the most unusual time and circumstances to go into a recession. When you look at the, the economic figures and it looks as though we may be in recession or heading to recession, and yet we have all these other economic uh, figures that are suggesting that things are in pretty good shape. And so as a result, there's a, a degree of uncertainty right now that is a little bit unusual. However, it's not unusual at all when you open your quarterly statement and it's down 20% year to date, which is roughly where the S&P 500 was at the end of the quarter. Thankfully, it's rebounded a little bit, but I think the volatility is likely to continue, you know, at least for a few more months. I don't think it's over yet. And while the Fed still debates whether or not they need another uh, interest rate increase, it's unlikely that we'll see the markets calm down. So we're probably in for this for a little while longer, but it, there is a lot of fear and there's a lot of uncertainty and inflation is pressing hard on those who are, are maybe living paycheck to, to paycheck. So there are certainly a number of things to consider. So you brought up the Wall Street Journal, right? And I'm thinking that one of the questions that I, I keep hearing all the time, and maybe you hear this, and we just can't wait for Scott to answer this question, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the question. It's like, okay, Joe says the market's going this way. Sally says the market's going this way. One person writes an article saying housing is here. Another person says housing is here. Oil's mm -hmm. going to do this. Oil's going to do that. Scott, tell us, where's the one place we go to get all the right answers about this volatile market you're talking about, right? <laughs> Surely there's some one place we can go. I wish there were. It'd be nice if we could just dial it in and know exactly what was going to happen next. But that's one of, the, one of the things that makes it exciting. In fact, when you talk about investing in the stock market, uh, one of the common uh, concepts is the risk premium. Well, the risk premium is the premium you get for not having any idea what's going to happen next. Uh, it's basically the return on top of the uh, guaranteed return, which obviously we can't answer that, that question. And, um, and I, I remind our clients that often that you can listen to the news and uh, read all that you'd like and do the best you can. But the data set today is different tomorrow and it will be that way all the time. So it's really more about uh, longer term trends and knowing how to process the information more so than uh, predicting what's gonna happen next for sure. So to kind of paraphrase a scripture, what you're saying is God brings the markets to reigneth upon the just and the unjust. You never exactly know what's going to happen, right? That's exactly right. That's the best, best description ever, for sure. So here we are as a bunch of believers. We're all sitting around this Zoom call, and some of them are watching this. They're going, okay, give me something I can make as a useful move as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ in this situation. So I, let me let me pose this question to you as we think about this. Um, you've given us a synopsis of, of kind of the volatility, the ups and downs in the market. In the, in the Christian community, we've got one crowd of people saying, hey, baby, be shrewd, be really, really shrewd. You probably need to start hoarding and stuffing your money in the mattresses and, and you know, buying the tin cans and putting them in the pantry and the bags of rice and you have the garbage can full of water over here on this side and for pete's sake get out of this crazy market because it's sinful that you even if you're putting 10 bucks in it's sinful that you be gambling your money in a market that's crazy like this so there's a camp right right let me ask you before i tell you the other camp what would you say to us if somebody just pitched that spiel to you what, what would you say to those folks that's that's a great question. And, and it's, it's probably more common than you would even imagine. Really? And I encounter, I encounter folks every day who have that sense about the doomsday of the market. And I've been doing this for 25 years and I've had those same conversations for 25 years. It's, it's the same um, circumstances. And it's an interesting thing because I often hear folks will say, well, you know, it's different this time. And then they start listing all the reasons that it's different. And, and my response to that is, you know, if you look, look back over the history of the market and the volatility and the risks that we encounter, every time that the market is volatile, every time it's going down like this, uh, it's a different set of circumstances. So, um, so you're right. It's different this time. It's different every time. 
and that's what makes it the same. So the risk that that the market um, imposes is um, is more acute, of course, when when we see declines. The volatility, of course, is just a normal uh, part of the process. But the declines, when they're coupled, especially now with the news cycle, the 24-hour news cycle, um, the uh, separate camps, the you know the uh, the conservatives versus the liberals, and the you know the various camps that are are fighting back and forth, and and I think more than ever the uh, news cycle has that that um, fear mongering effect of just generating this this uh, uh, turmoil, if you will, and and unsettledness, if you will, around uh, everything financial. I had a conversation just recently with with someone who uh, was was doing just that, just hoarding silver and uh, just buying up as much silver as they could and, and storing it in a gun safe at the house, you know, for fear that there'd be economic collapse. And, um, you know, I guess maybe at some point there, there could be an economic collapse and that gun safe full of silver would be, a, would be a good thing, but we haven't experienced it yet. And the risk has always been there. And uh, to me, the way I personally process that is as a believer, um, you know, in a real simple sense, I feel like the Lord has my back. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I think the Lord is going to protect us. And I don't think that that's me just um, Pollyanna. I think that, that that's scriptural in a number of senses. And so, um, so if I rely and put my trust in the Lord, I really believe that the Lord's going to protect us. And I think it's prudent. Um, you know, the, the Bible even says, in, I think it's in Ecclesiastes that you're supposed to uh, uh, save in six or seven different ways, you know, make sure you don't know what's going to happen. And it even says that you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen in the world, but just save and diversify. And that's the, that's the approach that I take. And that's how I uh, kind of uh, work through those, those uh, senses of fear and, and, uh, and times of volatility. So let's bring some theology together with your Wall Street expertise for just a minute, and and um, sure. I'll play the low end straight man, and you can you can give us a good answer for this because I'd fumble the ball if I ran with it. If if I look at Jesus talking about the parable of the talents being given to a series of servants, mm-hmm. A goes out and he tenfolds his return on investment, and B goes out and he doubles his oh, investment. C heads for the backyard, right? Digs the hole, drops it in there. From your point of view, would you suggest that for the typical American believer, digging the hole, putting the money in the mattress, staying away from the market is immoral or simply unwise? How would you take that parable and bring that up to the table, if you would at all, in a conversation with disciples. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, I think it would be hard for me to call it uh, immoral, um, uh, but certainly I think it's not the wisest thing to do. And and the reason that I would say that, and if we're going to go, if we're going to go full on theology, then one of the one of the stories that I like to to describe is the one um, different different versions of the Bible we'll call it the rich young man or the rich young ruler. And uh, to me, that's one of the best stories in the Bible with regards to um, our relationship to money and our relationship to God. And you, I know you know the story, but um, Jesus is walking down the road, and this young man, who obviously is a wealthy young man, you, you can see it on him. I mean, when he walks up, he just doesn't look like everyone else. Uh, they, even though it doesn't really describe him as a ruler in, the, in that passage, you can tell that he, he obviously has some influence. He has some wealth. He's probably dressed a little nicer than the people around him. He probably has an entourage, if most, you know, if it's consistent with today. And, uh, and he steps up to, to Jesus and he just asks a question. He says, you know, what, what do I have to do to be saved? And, and Jesus is so smart. He, he responds by saying, well, you know, the commandments. And Jesus begins to list the commandments. And if you, if you know anything about the Ten Commandments, um, they're somewhat ranked in order in a very specific way. And Jesus starts with the fifth one, and he works his way to the tenth one. So he describes six of the commandments, and he says, you know, you're not supposed to steal. Um, you're not supposed to commit adultery. You're not supposed to kill. And, of course, the rich and young ruler responds. He says, uh, you know, I've kept all those from my youth. And Jesus 
in a roundabout way says, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Oh, there's just one more thing. If you'll just do this, then we'll be right. I need you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And of course, in the passage, it says that the rich young ruler turns around and walks away sad. And he's sad because he has so much. He's been blessed so much that he can't fathom giving it to the poor. And, um, and what's neat about that passage of Scripture is when you look at the commandments that Jesus left out of the list, it's all the vertical commandments. It's all the commandments about our relationship with Him, not our relationship with each other. The bottom six are the relationship with each other. The top four are our relationship with God. And so essentially, he goes on to say, and Jesus says, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. So everyone knows that, that scripture. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. And the d- disciple said, well, who, who then can be saved? And he said, well, you know, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. But, but the point of that is, is that when you get to a point and the fear is just overcoming you because of everything that you're hearing in the news, what you're seeing on your statements, um, your fear about the money, then I reflect back on that relationship that Jesus had. That ruler or that young man, um, despite his wealth, I think his intentions were good. I think he had intended to, to really build that relationship with, with Jesus Christ right there at that moment. He wanted to know how to be saved. The problem was he didn't see that he had this hole in the relationship with God that he had tried to fill with money. And when I have uh, folks who come in and talk with me about the, the enormous fear that's just overtaking them because of something they've heard on the news or something they've seen in the Wall Street Journal, even the believers, I notice that they're laser focused on the account statement and they've stopped looking at God. So they've stopped looking at the provider and they're laser focused and maybe they're keeping the bottom six, but they've forgotten that the top four are the most important. That's really where, where it starts. And so, um, so from a theological per- perspective, I always turn back to that. And, uh, and it's not that I never live in fear or never have fear in my life, um, but I know where the comforter is. So if you think about the demographics of this podcast, Scott, a whole bunch of folks who identify a certain way are cheering right now. And they're going, man, you slammed it to those guys. In this case, you hammered the conservatives, right? You went and you went, get your freaking eyes off the statement. Stop being all wealth hoarded, you know, scared of taking the risk. Come on, come on, come on. Right. Now I want to ask you to flip flip the conversation around and and I'm going to take the passage that you brought up because I think it's a wonderful passage where we have this young man coming up to Christ. Jesus says, sell all you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. Now, all of a sudden, all my progressive friends who watch this podcast are going, yeah, yeah. uh," And the, and the, and the conservatives are going like, yeah, let's, let's see you guys sell everything you got and give it to the poor. (laughs) Come on, man. Come on, get, get rid of the Beamer, get rid of the house take it all down. Right. Scott, yeah. where does wealth become the problem in this conversation versus just simply being shrewd? Tell us yeah. that. I love that you asked that question because that's, um, that becomes the, the, the hammer, if you will, that, that you'll wield to kind of make a point. And, and the point of that passage is, is absolutely not that the, the average Christian should live in poverty. Um, you know, I love Larry Burkett's book that he wrote. Larry Burkett was the uh, founder of Christian Financial Concepts back when I was first becoming a financial planner, and he passed away, I guess, in the early 90s, and uh, was just a, just a hero for me. Christian Financial Concepts became Crown Financial Ministries, and they rolled that in together, so they, they kept, the, kept the ball rolling, but he, he wrote a book uh, called The Word on Finances, and uh, it, it contains many of the scriptures in the word there. Um, he says over a thousand scriptures in the word about money. 
And, uh, and what you find is the theme is not that the Christian needs to live in poverty. And so, so the message that Jesus gave to the rich young man is not a universal message about how we're to live. So to, to sell everything, give everything to the poor, and, and live in destitute po poverty. That's not the message. Uh, but it was a very clear message what Jesus was saying to the rich young, young ruler, the rich young man in the context of that discussion. He could see his heart was wrong, not his finances. And so if you get into the details of the finances, you'll find many other scriptures that tell you it is the right thing to do for you to have a steady job. It's the right thing for you to have a, an emergency fund. It's the right thing for you to do. Uh, you're investing and be in the right way. It's, but the difference is making sure that you're placing God ahead of the money and not in reverse. Folks, you're listening to The Disciple Dilemma. We're talking with Scott McLeod, the president of Brown Financial Advisory, and we're talking about recessions, inflations, and wars. What in the world should a disciple do? We'll be right back. Folks, welcome back to The Disciple Dilemma. We're talking with Scott McLeod, the president of Brown Financial Advisory, and we're talking about the subject recessions, inflation, war, what's a disciple to do? Uh, in our first half of the conversation, Scott and I were talking about the constructs in Scripture, about what are we supposed to act like, live like, be like, and we started down the path I'm going to try to summarize this, Scott. You tell me if I'm uh, getting to first and second base or if I'm uh, fouled out here. <laughs> we talked a little bit about the idea that we as disciples of Christ are called not to be shaken by the news, but we're supposed to be faithful in our behavior, even if we've got some crazy headlines going on. Mm -hmm. I, right. heard, I think I heard you say that. Yes. I think I heard you talk a little bit about the idea that some Christians, this typically tends to fall to the conservative side for the error. We start staring at the bottom line going, wow, that's a really big number. Holy mackerel. I, I got to really start fretting and worrying about that. That's a big problem for me. And that, that may be the conservative error theologically. Yes, right. Often. Then, then we've got the progressives who are, who are in here. And, and the progressives were going like, Hey, you know what you got to do is you got to give everything away. The book Ron Sider wrote about uh, 40 years ago, rich Christians in an age of hunger said, Scott, you're going to be a believer. Jesus told that young guy, that rich young ruler, you got to give away everything, sell everything and come follow me. And if you're not doing that, you're just not a good Christian. Right. That's the progressive side of the ledger. And you're pushing back on that one as a little bit of an area. Did we get that right? A little bit, yes, a little bit. I think the, I think the, uh, you know, even on that side, I think we we have a responsibility to give, and the responsibility to give sacrificially, but not necessarily give everything. Let's triangulate this from one other direction, and so I'll just pitch this ball at you, and you can you can either dribble or shoot. It's your choice, right? Okay. So, um, I'm twenty something. I've come out of college. I got student debt. I'm making kind of not the kind of money that I'll bet you rich white guys are making. And I'm listening to you talk to us and like, are you freaking out of your mind? I'm supposed to give money away in my situation. And that's tough, especially in, in today's environment. Uh, when you come out of college with record levels of, of student debt and you're trying to pay the debt and maybe the job market's starting to soften as it is right now and may soften more. I think that's the objective of the Fed is to, to cause the job market to soften more. So what do you do? And, um, and I think that's when you, you stick with the fundamentals. And the fundamentals include all of those elements, but they may include them at different, different levels. Um, so of course, the, uh, the, the debt repayment is a critical part of what, what you're doing. Um, so is the giving part. But you know, when you think about it from practical, uh, practical terms, uh, what we do is we just teach, first of all, that it's important to have an emergency fund. So how do you do that? I mean, uh, how do you accumulate enough for an emergency fund? It doesn't have to be a lot of money. It just has to be a cushion. And so even if it's just a little bit every month, 
a few months pass and before you know it, you have enough money set aside that you can that you can make it if something goes wrong. And then, um, you know, then the other part is consistent working. And um, and that's the uh, that's the thing that seems to be lost a little bit in this environment right now. And it's interesting because uh, we have a, a, a very low unemployment rate. We have a lot of open jobs, but there are still people who seem to can't seem to not be able to find a place to work. And and I think that it's a little bit of a mindset. Um, they want to find the perfect job. And I think in some some cases, having a job makes it easier to find a better job. And I would encourage uh, going to work there. And then the fundamentals, um, the thing about the, the basics, the blocking and tackling of, of what the Bible says about money, and that includes the giving part, and that includes the saving part, it's the peace of mind that comes along with that. And from a very early stage, uh, my wife and I we were married in our 20s, and we just resolved ourselves to make sure that giving was a part of what we did. Um, we ran close some months, you know, early in our careers. Um, you know, we had children, and I have a child with special needs, and so we have some extra expenses related there. And, you know, buying a house and buying cars and fixing, you know, broken dishwashers and things like that, you, you inevitably end up in a situation where you're, you're going to run it really close at the end of the month. But we still resolved ourselves to give, and and we think that the you know the Bible teaches that you're supposed to give of the first fruits. It talks about the first fruits, which just means off the top essentially. And uh, you know, there's some some debate about what a tithe means and what it means for a New Testament Christian. But and so I would say to the young person, uh, you have to trust the you have to trust the process. If you've ever heard that, and by sticking with the process. Um, the Bible also says there's a there's a great great scripture in the I think it's in the book of Psalms and it says um, I once was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread and basically it's just a reinforcing that it may not always be clear it may not always always be obvious that you have the ability to do that but there comes a, a point with faith where you just trust. You just trust the process. You just continue with the process. And in that faith, um, the Bible teaches that, that you'll be rewarded, you'll be protected, and you'll be blessed. And I, I believe that wholeheartedly. So the, the final triangulation, actually, it's a quadrangulation because we have the fourth, we have sort of That's the fourth, fourth leg of this then right. is building on exactly what you just said surely if I love Jesus and I am following Jesus and I am praying to Jesus and I'm giving money to Jesus, I'm going to prosper and become wealthy because you just quoted some great passages and they promised me that, Scott. So aren't you as a financial advisor telling me as a Christian, if I'll just bless into the offering plate with my gross, it's going to be fabulous. Scott, what do you say? <laughs> Oh, don't I wish it worked that way. Um, but that's the other thing is, you know, uh, you have to learn that, that the Lord is not an ATM. And, uh, and so blessings are not always financial. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that those, it's about the process and, and, and trusting more than it is about the blessings. If you're just doing it for the blessings, then you're, then you're missing the point. Um, the point is, is the relationship, and it's it's following the process as being true to what the word says and honoring the Lord with your wealth. And by doing that, the blessings come in different ways, and they may come in ways that you never even imagined. Uh, you hear stories like uh, missionaries. We were we were talking as we prepared for our our discussion today, just talking about that missionary journey. And uh, you hear about missionaries all around the world who give their lives, literally give their lives. Um, even just like the old, um, you know, the, the first New Testament Christians, they give their lives for the word. Is that a blessing? Well, it's hard to say that, you, you know, you're, you're, you're sac literally sacrificing your life, and that's a, that's a good thing because we all try to preserve our lives, but it's, it's not about that. It's about pursuing, and uh, you may remember the missionary in uh, Ecuador back, back in the 1950s, Jim Elliott, who, um, who took a team down to the indigenous people in Ecuador in the Amazon jungle, and he was ministering to them. And that team uh, came in and they were, they were ministering to this, this group of indigenous, uh, they call them Indians, but they were, they were uh, 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 peoples that were living in the Amazon. And of course they, they killed the missionary team. They killed Jim Elliott. 
And then his wife, Elizabeth, went to live with that tribe and teach them about Jesus. And they were stunned. How, how could you come and live with us when we've just killed your husband? And, and she was doing what she knew God had called them to do from the beginning, and she was carrying it on. Later on, someone asked, um, ask Elizabeth Elliot, how many people do you imagine were saved or how many, how many of those, you know, indigenous peoples have been converted because he gave his life? And her answer to that question was, it's not about that. It's about doing what we've been commanded to do. I'm not the one to keep score. I'm the one to be obedient. And so the, the bottom line is that obedience not the keeping score. So if you're putting money in the plate so you get $2 back, you've missed the point. Uh, the point is about the obedience. Let the Lord keep the score. And so we've got to put this quote out on the podcast because you've just raised one of my heroes up on this. We, we got to tell them the quote, okay? The quote, right? So I, I, want, I, want to, I want to start the quote. If you want to finish it, you just tell me you got it, right? But I want to start out with Jim Elliott who made this quote, which is the real bottom line that disciples... Your life may be just hunky-dory, rosy, and delightful. Everything is great. Your life may be very hard. You may be like Hebrews 11, getting sawn in half and torn in shreds by the beast. Right. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this thing is a, is a quote that's just absolutely a killer. And the killer quote goes that, it, this is from Jim Elliott, right? This is this amazing thing. No fool is he who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. This is the amazing part about discipleship, right? Because we're staring at the fact that as disciples, when we're talking about monetary reward, lifestyle reward, health, prosperity, family, it may be fine. But in the end, no fool is he who gives what he cannot keep. That's our life to gain what he can never lose, which is there, there is a reward that's beyond belief. Let, so, so let me, let me kind of play that one out with you as we begin to wrap this down. Um, I would like for you to think about now your audience that's watching this, our group of pastors, elders, deacons, small group leaders going, how am I supposed to help coach the people that are with me about the times we're in. Sky, you just said it a little while ago, the market is volatile. What do you want me to do? Yeah, that's, that's really tough. When, when I sit down with folks and, and they really are in that state, when they're in that fearful state, I start, if, if they're believers, we, we talk on a different level. I start to break it down uh, around what the fear really is. So um, that's, the, that's the interesting thing about it. Oftentimes, folks can't quantify it. They can't, they can't exactly say why they're fearful. They have some might have an underlying fear, and, and oftentimes we call those money messages. They're things that they've grown up with. Maybe they've had uh, a difficult uh, life when they were growing up. Maybe they grew up in poverty, and now they, don't, they're not, they have money, and they're, they're concerned about losing it. Or, or maybe they're concerned about their um, uh, legacy that they leave for their children. What I do and, uh, and what I do with our, um, uh, our folks in our small group and, and people that I'm related to in, at church, I make sure that they understand, first of all, the more practical side of the market, which is up and down, up and down. It's always been up and down. That won't change. Um, that's going to be consistent from now on. Um, then, I, then I retrain them on the so many scriptures that just reinforce that if we're doing what we should do, the Lord's going to protect us. The Lord's going to be there with us and, and guide us. And if we're laser focused on him, and if we're grateful, and if we're, if we're worshiping, if we're uh, trusting, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to be fearful. Um, so if we're overcome by fear, it's because we're not focused on the things that, the blessings, if you will. And we focus on the blessings, we, there's always uncertainty. But if we focus on the blessings, it tends to erase the fears. And the word's full of those opportunities. Uh, you know, many of those thousand scriptures just talk about how faithful the Lord is to us and how comforting the Lord is to us and that our joy comes from the Lord. And, and so if we're focused on the Lord, it's going to be very difficult for us to be 
fearful of the environment that's around us. Maybe we won't know, maybe we'll be uncertain. I'm uncertain uh, every day. When the market's up, I'm concerned it'll come down. When the market's down, I'm worried how long it's gonna stay there. And, and it's mostly um, trying to make sure that our, our, our clients, the folks that we work with are not fearful um, because frankly, if you put it in context, um, there's very little to be fearful about. So your advice to leaders, then if I'm kind of reading you right, is that the idea of being fearful is actually an idolatry that destroys us in our following as a disciple. Fearfulness, when we think about fear, uh, it often is a word used in many different contexts, and society likes to use the word fear today as a meritorious defense mechanism, when in fact, mm -hmm. the conversation typically around fear, if we look at it biblically, is if there's a lion coming, you should get a lot of sweat going, a lot of energy going, you should have an awful lot of muscle mass moving you out of the place where the lion is coming from. Right. But the flip side is when we're thinking about the materiality that God has given to us, the idea of becoming fretful and fearful, leaders owe their people the peace and the joy of Christ and not the fear of the headlines and the markets. Am I hearing you right there? I, I couldn't agree more. And they have to exhibit that as well. Um, they have to demonstrate that peace. They have to demonstrate that, that joy. And um, I consider it a compliment when our clients ask me, you know, how can you, how can you not be fearful in a situation like this? Why, why are you not afraid? And, um, and so, you know, the underlying message is that uh, I, know, I know where my blessings come from, so I'm not going to be fearful. Uh, the other message is uh, I also know what the numbers say. And so just in general, I'm not, I'm not going to be fearful. But, uh, but when they can see that peace in me, then that helps them through difficult times. I think it's the responsibility of the leaders to, to, to exhibit that same peace so that they can latch on to that, that peace and just frankly see you know, what comes from the inside out and not, not what's on the outside coming in, if you will. So the wrap-up question for you is, surely the motto of your organization is we're here to make you filthy rich. Isn't that the motto? Isn't that why you guys exist? Why do you guys exist at Brown Financial Advisory? <laughs> right. And, uh, and you know our tagline well, I think. But uh, our tagline is live with purpose. That um, Live with purpose because life is not about accumulating assets. And the whole point of that tagline is that we want people to feel empowered to live into the calling that they all have on their lives. And if they can, if they can not be fearful, um, then they can be great givers. If they cannot be fearful, they can be great goers and uh, doing ministry. If they're not, if they're not fearful, then they can comfort those around them who are fearful. And I think that's, uh, in essence, that's the purpose of the church. That's the big calling, uh, the big C church. That's the purpose of our our calling is to to go out and reach this fearful, lost confused, misguided world and, and bring them in comfort, but we can't do it without our own stability. You can't, you know, it's, it's like uh, uh, when you're on the airplane and they tell you, be sure to put your own uh, mask on before you, you put the mask on of the person next to you if you need the oxygen. And that's the idea is that we need to be filled with the spirit. We need to be filled with that joy. We need to be filled with that peace because that's what the world's looking for. And without that, they really don't have much to stand on. And so that's what we're here for. That's what we're, that's what we're driven to do. Folks, thanks for watching us today at the Disciple Dilemmas. We talk about recessions, wars, inflation. What in the world is a disciple supposed to do? Our guest today has been Scott McLeod, the president of Brown Financial Advisory, who has a beautiful resume called by Christ to serve in this part of the universe, helping us understand more about that part of the universe as disciples. Scott, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure, Dennis. Thank you for having me. And for the rest of you out there, we're asking you to please help us at the Disciple Dilemma. And the reason why we need your help is because the digital marketplace is very crowded. It's hard to get the word out. We're trying to help people understand modern Western discipleship has been hacked. We've been told, like we heard Scott talking about today, that 
some of our ideas are get really scared, get really crazy, either stuff all the money in the mattress or don't keep a dime for yourself. And we've also become very brittle and fragile in the way we think about serving Christ. Scott's helped us think about that. We need your help to help the disciple dilemma get the word out. The discipleship has been hacked. What is a believer supposed to do? And the way we want you to do that is you watch these YouTube videos is that little button in the lower right hand corner that says subscribe, punch it won't cost you anything helps us get leverage in the marketplace to get the word out and follow us go over to Facebook there's this thing called the disciple dilemma use the disciple dilemma follow us out there or you can go to Instagram the disciple dilemma or you can go to our website which is the disciple dilemma.com and you can see what's going on we've got blogs videos like this with Scott a lot of conversations about why we think discipleship has been hacked and why you as leaders have to get in the game to change the culture that's destroying discipleship in the modern Western world. And as always, thanks for listening.